All right, welcome back to Acts chapter 5. We're uh, looking once again at the trial of the 12 in front of the Sanhedrin. They're uh, intending to kill the 12. Uh, they've killed Jesus, they might as well knock out his 12 uh, main representatives now and try to put a stop to this incredible movement where thousands upon thousands of people are turning to faith in Jesus Christ in their city of Jerusalem and multitudes of people are being healed. Oh my goodness, religion wants to put an end to that. And it's all based in the jealousy which was in their hearts because they knew they were losing influence and power. And people who love power hate to give it up and lose it. Uh, but providentially, uh, 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 an influential Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel stands up and gives his advice to them and says, uh, you know, if this plan or action is of men, uh, it will be overthrown, verse 39, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may be even found fighting against God. And so clearly, Gamaliel and everybody else there who follows his advice realizes that uh, this really is of God, and they're just letting a little bit of truth sneak out to give them just a tad bit of wisdom. This Gamaliel, I just wanted to mention to you real briefly, he was an extremely influential Pharisee, a great teacher of the law, respected way outside of Jerusalem. Um, the Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, when uh, he, he was uh, at one time a Pharisee. He testified in Acts chapter 22, verse number three. May I just uh, mention this to you? He said, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God. And, and so you see, he, this man was an influence uh, before the apostle Paul was the apostle Paul, just uh, Saul of, of Tarsus. All right, so back to the story now. So we're in Acts chapter 5 and verse number 40. Uh, they took his advice, Gamaliel's advice, and after calling the apostles in, listen to this, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then release them. They already had told Peter and John that just you know a few days earlier, apparently, maybe a few weeks, who knows the exact chronology, but they didn't listen to them, and they led then, and they're not about to listen to them now because we must obey God rather than men. But they were flogged, I mean, either with a whip or a stick, that's what flogging implies, beaten, you know, to uh, motivate them to listen to the orders of the Sanhedrin. Well, they didn't uh, obey the Sanhedrin. Um, verse number 41, so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And there, too, is a, a great example for us. You know, we who sometimes think we have it so bad just because maybe some friends or relatives are shunning us because we've decided to follow Christ or we get a little persecution at our job or someone pokes fun at us or makes a joke because we're a holy roller or something. Well, these guys were uh, literally beaten for their faith. Probably something that you, certainly something that I have never experienced. But in any case, to whatever persecution you have received, rejoice about it. In fact, Peter wrote that in one of his epistles, you know, to the degree that you suffer for the, for the cause of Christ, keep on rejoicing. We're, we're lay, you know, it's, it's proof positive that you're one of the redeemed when people don't like you for the sake of Christ. So they, just, they were just rejoicing. Even though whatever part of their body was beaten, they were saying, thank you, Jesus, that we're worthy to suffer shame for your name. And nothing changes. They're not intimidated in the least. Verse 42, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Now, just as we finish out the segment, you know, these guys were in a unique environment at that point in time. They're in Jerusalem. This is a Jewish city. It's, a, it's got a, a very, very Jewish culture that is dominated, of course, by the, the Jewish religion. Everybody there knows the customs, the cultures, whether they're practicing Jews, whether they're devout Jews or not. Everybody is very familiar with Old Testament prophecies, the whole concept of a Messiah. And so their message to the Jewish population who, by and large, were anticipating that eventually a Messiah would come because he had been promised over and over again uh, that Jesus 
was the Christ. And so they had an easy job in one sense because they, they had the Old Testament scriptures, you know, and all they had to do was quote them and then show how Jesus fulfilled those scriptures. And that would be a lovely opportunity, wouldn't it, to, to, to speak to somebody who's very familiar with all the Old Testament messianic prophecies and then quote to them, show them the facts of how Jesus fulfilled them. I've actually tried that at times with uh, some Jewish people, but unfortunately the people that I, I did speak to um, were not that conversant in their own scriptures. Um, you know, they could actually pray in Hebrew, but didn't even know what they were saying, you know, and it was a real disappointment. But if you get a chance to share Jesus with a Jewish person, I mean, they will show respect for the scripture, whether they know the scripture or not. Well, I would take them to, for example, uh, Psalm 22 or Psalm 69 or Isaiah chapter 53, you know, and there's just lots and lots of scriptures that Jesus fulfilled from the Old Testament that are very convincing to those who are open-minded and sincere. And we'll see that when Paul went uh, you know, to the Gentiles, ultimately, uh, the message did, did change. Not, not the call to repentance, not the call to believe in Jesus Christ, but he wasn't immediately appealing to the Old Testament scriptures to his Gentile audience because they had no respect for the Old Testament, nor did they have any really knowledge of the Old Testament. So they had to come at them from a little bit different angle. But this is kind of a training ground for the apostles. Go to the Jews first. You're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and uh, then Samaria and, and then even to the remotest part of the earth. And that's exactly the progression we see here in the book of Acts. Okay, so now we're turning a corner, uh, a new chapter as it's marked in, in most Bibles in Acts chapter 6, and we're going to see some of the pitfalls of um, handouts, all right? Something that a lot of us are facing today. Can't wait to talk about that. And so I'll see you next time. Heavenward 7 is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you.